from the biopsy. That's a, that's a huge thing. Obviously, uh, still scares and obviously more continued checking, but that's a huge positive uh, praise right there. Um, who else? March 19th, it's not this Saturday, but the following Saturday is uh, the men's breakfast. Uh, it's going to be an awesome time. Uh, we've done them in the past, but it's been a while, so now we're going to, we do them on Wednesday sometime, but now, I mean, is we're going to have, hopefully, invite all your friends, bring everybody uh, here at the church at 8.30. Uh, it's kind of potluck style, um, but if you don't make anything, that's fine. I'm sure there's going to be plenty of food being made. Uh, we're gonna throw all kinds. Of, I think I'm gonna make some sausage gravy because I, I, I do a good job at it. You know, uh, I, I do. I do. I like cooking. Um, uh, so everybody else, come on down and join us with it. So. Mm-hmm. And it's nice to have you back. <laughs> and Brenda. Women's Bible study, 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. this Thursday. No, no dinner this time. No dinner. No dinner. Bar. A little advertisement. Uh, Bissell Maple Farms in Jefferson. This uh, coming Saturday is having a open house. Free pancakes and sausage. So Maple Farm is having an open house, and you get might be something to take your scouts to. Mm -hmm. Get some pancakes. Maybe we can serve there. Uh, who else? Uh, first, we oh. have eggs. In the Lots of eggs. <laughs> It's a blessing. He's doing good. And we uh, put in an offer on a house last week nice. and we got accepted. That's so. awesome. <laughs> it's huge. It's huge. We are, it's out on Route 7 in Pierpont. So we close on April 5th. You're all out that way with uh, Darwin and them. <laughs> so we uh, I have a lot to do with being pregnant and packing a house. <laughs> and I'm sure there's some people here that would love to help. Or at least will, willing to help. Yeah. That's awesome. We're <laughs> That's awesome. That's answers to prayer because I know that was a, uh, a prayer request like a few weeks back, and so now it's closing and uh, everything is. That's an answer to prayer, and we know how hard that is. Uh, Linda. It delights my heart to see my son Justin. It is. Me too. It's amazing. I mean, it's kind of sad because. I remember when I was younger, but then I can remember people that were younger than me running around down here, and that's what I, I, I still see you that way. Sorry, Justin. <laughs> Mike. Um, uh, Trey Lake had our uh, mm. annual women's uh, camp in Friday night and Saturday afternoon. It was a good time. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, found some big talent on the show. Thank you. 
It's awesome. And that's kind of what its intention is, right? We see these guys are trying to grow with leadership in the last uh, camp out and such. And so now they get to help out in the Woodlands little in indoor camp out and kind of grow and show them how they were leaders, you know. And so hopefully they'll build off of that and they're going to keep expanding generation to generation. Uh, who else? Yeah. Praise God for his blessing and thank everyone for your prayers. Mm -hmm. Better half is back by my side. That's it. That's, it. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Good healing. He is God is good. Oh. Yes, uh, please take note as you leave today that there's a flag environment that mm -hmm. against the wall there. So if you have a flag that needs uh, retired, bring it in here. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll take care of it until it's time to retire properly. Mm -hmm. We have a flag retirement. Uh, been now here that the boys that's one of the things that uh, uh, that they learned to do is how to properly dispose of a retired flag so uh, definitely anybody out there in the community this is a good opportunity for you guys to do it right instead of just throwing it in the trash or burning it or something you know so there's a proper method of doing it so to be respectful to our country so please drop it off out here who else Tim. Yeah, and, uh, Kids are dismissed. Before I start, uh, we're going to look at 2 Peter chapter 1 in just a moment. But I know that you've been watching the news as well and you've been distressed over what's happening in uh, Ukraine. Um, I just want you to know we have a little bit of a close connection with that. Jeff Abrams, who is the minister of the Tuscumbia Church of Christ, that's the church where Brenda and I were a part of while I was in school about 400 years ago. And so we've kept in touch with them and Brenda gets the email bulletin. And uh, while the Russian troops were starting to build up, Jeff was over in the Ukraine working with some of the churches and was concerned about whether he would be able to get out. And finally, he was able to get a commercial flight out and get safely home. Um, but they have been working with some organizations that are helping folks who are fleeing from Russia, from Ukraine. And so far, the, the news we're hearing is that 1.4 million refugees have fled the country, most of them into Poland. And this organization that Jeff is working with is in Poland. And uh, so he was raising some money to, to help them to buy food and housing for the folks, and we sent them some money. So you've got a connection with them. Um, and they need our prayers. It's distressing. It's complicated. Uh, there's a limit to what we can do. And we're all, I know we're all at the gas pumps feeling the effects of this. We thought it was bad already, and gas prices have been just jumping up every day. Um, anyways, pray for Ukraine. In fact, I think we should just pause for a moment right now and do that. Lord God of heaven, we know that Jesus said that there would be wars and rumors of wars, and we're witnessing it right now. We know that it comes from greed, selfishness. It comes from human sin. And Lord, we know that you are the righteous judge, and we ask you to judge this situation. We know that a lot of innocent people have lost their lives. 
lot of families who lived stable, normal lives like we do, and relative comfort have been disrupted, have seen their homes destroyed, or have had to just flee with the clothes on their backs. Give them comfort and peace, Lord. Especially we pray that you would be with your, your people, the ones who, who name Christ as their Savior. Help them to have a strong faith, to trust you through this, to receive peace and comfort knowing that you have not abandoned them. And Lord, help them to be shining examples of your kingdom, even in the difficult situations they're finding themselves in. Father, we know that you ultimately can control global affairs. We saw the way you did it in the book of Daniel. And throughout Old Testament history, we saw the way you used the rulers of the first early first century days to bring about the death of Jesus that paid for our sins. Lord, when man thinks he is powerful, you show that you're more powerful. And so please bring your kingdom victory through this and help the people of Ukraine. Help us to learn lessons from this and to remember what's most important. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Imagine if you were able to sit down with somebody who'd been alive during the time that Jesus was on the earth. Someone that had spent three intense years with Jesus, one of his closest friends. And this fellow said, let me help you to grow a strong faith that will withstand anything. Would you take advantage of that? Well, Peter offers that to us in this short letter of 2 Peter. It has been questioned, neglected, and debated over the centuries. Some scholars have concluded that it wasn't really written by Peter, that it couldn't have been because it, it tells about things that were going to happen to Peter. It touches on the miraculous, and these scholars don't believe in the miraculous. They say the tone of it's different in his first letter, and, and the vocabulary is different. In addition, they say, you know, there was even a dispute about it in the first century or two. The truth of it is, though, it did end up being recognized as part of the New Testament. And the vocabulary and the tone of it could be explained by the fact that it was written much later than the first letter, that it was very close to Peter's death, and he knew it, and that the whole circumstances had changed. So we're going to spend the next few weeks learning as much from it as we can. But let me start simply by reading the first 11 verses to you. Simeon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, may grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly, brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This letter is written to us. He tells us the very first opening words. The first letter from Peter says it's directed to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. Now the dispersion or diaspora in Greek was talking about the Jews that had been scattered, especially the ten tribes that had been scattered all over the world during times of captivity to the point that they had lost their identity as individual tribes. The scattered Jews all over the world. And so the first letter was written to Jewish Christians. But the second letter, he says, is addressed to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. He's talking about those who were not a part of those who knew God, but became part. He's talking about us, non-Jews, Gentiles as they're called. He's talking about we Gentile believers. And it was likely written late in the first century, 67 or 68 AD. It's generally believed that Peter died somewhere around 68 or 69 AD. There's a sense of urgency to this letter. That's understandable, isn't it? Peter knew he wasn't going to be around much longer. And he wanted to say something that they could never forget and that would help them to guarantee their faith. And so he emphasizes truth and knowledge. Look at these words again. He says, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Then he continues and says, His divine power is granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. God has given us tools to become like Jesus, to become partakers of the divine nature. And he says, we just have to use those tools. This echoes what Paul said to Timothy in his second letter to Timothy. When he says, all scripture is breathed out by God, is God breathed, and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. He's saying that you've got all the tools you don't have to wait for further revelation. You don't have to wait for a gifted writer to write a book to, to tell you what you need to know to be close to God and to have a firm faith. God's given everything to you. All the equipment you need, pay attention to it. It's in the book. You don't have to wait for new ideas to come out. And you must not pay attention to something that is new, that goes beyond Scripture. And frankly, that's where a lot of people are today. Sometimes they call it New Age religion. Sometimes when you're talking to somebody, it sounds like they have basically Christian ideas, but then there's some strange stuff added on to it. It's the old cafeteria-style religion. You know, when you go through the line, you say, you know what, I think I'll just take a little snippet of Buddhism here, and a little bit of Hinduism, 
I'll, uh, I'll take maybe one scoop of Christianity and we'll put this together because, yeah, that makes me feel good. That's the one I like. He says, you know what? The truth is the truth, and he's given us his truth. It's God-breathed truth. It's in God's word. Now, that's not to say that we always understand it correctly. We've talked about that in recent weeks, and so our, our job is to pursue it humbly, <laughs> to listen to what it says instead of putting our meaning into it. But we've got everything we need to grow in godliness, to become like Jesus. And the tools center around helping us around the knowledge of God and of, our, and of Jesus our Lord, he says. Peter knew Jesus from the beginning of his public ministry. And he wants to help us know Jesus better. Peter, Peter knew him personally. He, he saw his inflections, his, the way he dealt with people, he, the way he carried himself, the way he looked at you. Sometimes when Jesus looked at him, it made him uncomfortable when he had really messed up. But even then, it was not a look of judgment, it was a look of love and of hurt. So our knowledge of Jesus needs to be more than just knowing about him. The goal is to know him. To know him by experiencing him. Now that sounds, how do you do that, Tim? Well, you start by reading what he says. Spend a lot of time in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, I, I think here's a good guide for reading the Bible. Spend at least a third or half of your time reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And then read the rest from Genesis to Malachi and Acts to Revelation. But spend most of your time in Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Witness Jesus. Hear what he has to say. Get a feel for him. And then talk to him about it. I guarantee you, if you'll spend a lot of time reading Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you'll spend a lot more time praying, asking questions confessing, thanking, rejoicing, celebrating. You'll be amazed at him. You'll find things, wow, he's even better than I thought he was. And you'll want to talk to him. And that's how your friendship with him will grow. And you will come to know Jesus. And you know what will happen then? You will become more like Jesus. He's, he's, he's a good friend to be around. Some of our friends, when we hang around them, we develop their vocabulary, and it's not a good vocabulary, if you know what I mean. Sometimes we develop their attitudes. I mean, like Wednesday morning, I go home and Brenna said, where did you get that attitude? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Dick and Tim and Dan. I'm just kidding. Just pulling your legs, guys. <laughs> Actually, probably other people ask you, where have you been around? Who have you been hanging around with? That Krauss guy again? <laughs> yeah, well, I told you to keep away from him. <laughs> but when you hang around Jesus, you find yourself looking at people more from his point of view than from your point of view, where you're annoyed at them, you're impatient with them, you're disgusted by them. Because when he looks at people, he sees what they can be. He looks at them with eyes of love, with eyes of concern, with eyes of correction sometimes, because he wants the best for us. So the goal is to get to know him better. And in this letter, Peter gives us something to work on. He gives us some, some mile marks. 
progress markers. You know, he says that here's, here is what a growing faith looks like. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness. Don't you like that word? Steadfastness. Endurance. Stick to itiveness, tenacity, and steadfastness with godliness, a healthy respect for God, an adoration and an appreciation, a worship of God, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. This, some have called this the ladder of Christian growth. <laughs> It helps us become shaped like Jesus. It's, it means we're growing in being morally excellent. That we're growing in knowledge, we're gaining self-control. We're having endurance and reliability. A reverent and worshipful attitude toward God. That we warmly love our fellow Christians. We don't just tolerate them, but we we actively love them. We, we enjoy them. We have affection for them. And we grow in that kind of unselfish love that God has for us, that agape love. He breaks down two words that are translated love. Philadelphia and agape. He puts both, both in it. The one translated brotherly affection. It's self-explanatory, isn't it? And the one translated agape is the one that he uses in 1 Corinthians 13. It's the one that is used when he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It is, as one author calls it, unconquerable caring. It is caring for another person when it has absolutely no benefit to you. It goes way beyond sympathy. Sometimes we act out of sympathy. We feel sorry for someone. Agape is way beyond that. Agape looks at a person and says, you are precious to God because you're made in his image and he loves you. And even though at this point I don't, I don't see that in you yet, I know God does, and so I choose to love you. I will do what love requires. I will take care of you. I will help you. I will forgive you. I will want the best for you. I will pray for you. It's not out of sympathy. It's out of obedience. <laughs> I guarantee you, in every one of your relationships, you want people who love you that way. Now, you want them to love you more than that. You want them to love you with Philadelphia, with, with brotherly affection. You want, if you're married to them, you want them to love you with Eros. You want them to love you with family love, with Storge, which is what binds families together. We're, we're kin, we're blood, and there's just some special bond we have. All the words in the Greek language, all four words that are translated love, we need all those. But I'll tell you what, if you don't have agape, then all the other three end up being manipulative kinds of love that simply try to move you into a position to meet your needs. But agape says, it's not about me, it's about you. I mean, what did it gain God when he gave his most precious son to be tortured and crucified for us? When we're the ones who have offended God, sinned against him, rejected him, disrespected him, what did it gain him? It surely did not gain him justice. He gave up the right to justice. 
when he, his son said, put it on me, Father. Put the justice on me that they deserve. So it is, was completely unselfish love. And he says, I want you to love each other that way. And if we don't pursue this kind of growth and these kind of characteristics and this kind of a faith that is solid and reliable and is based on knowing Christ, he says this about us. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. The word nearsighted, <laughs> it's the Greek word myopazone. Now maybe you've been told that you're myopic. Don't be offended by that, I'm myopic. I am nearsighted. I can see very well right here. Unlike Roger, I could read this without my glasses. But you're a little fuzzy. <laughs> you might want to do something about that. Oh, you did. <laughs> so it's the distance that I have trouble seeing. I need correction on that. If I were, if I couldn't see up close, I'd be hyperopic. But I'm myopic. And he says, if you lack these qualities, you're so nearsighted that you're blind and you forgot what you were forgiven of. Now think about what that means. The person who forgets how much he's been forgiven loses gratitude toward God and loses toward humility with other people. And you've run into people that way. Maybe you've even found yourself being that way at times. When you start to think, you know, you never say these things because it makes you sound like a terrible person. And who wants to be thought of as a terrible person, right? So we would never say it. We just think it. I am so much better than that guy. I would never do the slimy things he does. That's, that's myopic. That's being blind and forgetting what you've been forgiven of. Or maybe it comes out toward God. And instead of a deep humility toward God saying, I am so grateful for what you've forgiven me of. It's a matter of, why is my life so hard? Why do these things keep happening to me, God? I thought you were supposed to be a good God. Why do you let this happen to me? And God is saying, wait a minute. Is this the same person that a few years ago 